good. Please remember to do your uh, nano quizzes. There were a couple of people that didn't get it done. That's easy points you're giving away. So don't do that. And then for the patient scenario on Anisoft, just remember all you have to do is just upload that under the assignments tab. You don't need to send me a copy of it. Uh, when you upload it there, it should pre-populate and be available. So today we're going to talk about some stuff in PACU, but beforehand I want to cover uh, next Tuesday. I have a scheduling conflict on Tuesday, so there's going to be a video link posted. Um, there are also some reviews of pain pathways that are posted on the content site for that day. So no in-person class next Tuesday. It'll just be a video you guys can watch on YouTube. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and I'll go over stuff with you. All right, uh, so like I said, today we're going to talk about some stuff for the uh, post anesthesia care unit. So basic objectives is kind of to follow the patient's pathway as they progress from the OR to the PACU, uh, understanding how the PACU works because you may find that you are uh, very intimately involved in the operation of PACU and recovery in some facilities. Other places you may have very little to do with it. Some places you might not even take your patient to recovery. Um, some of the tightly controlled physician practices, you never leave the room and they transport the patient out there for you. Uh, and then finally, we're going to discuss things that may happen uh, as a result of the anesthetic or the surgical procedure that become very apparent in the recovery room. So I'm going to open this up real quick for you guys to see it. These are the uh, ANA practice standards. If you haven't looked at it before, this is basically this standard you're held to as far as things go. Um, you know, basic stuff, patients, autonomy, dignity, privacy, that sort of things. Um, but the second one here, uh, the pre-anesthesia patient assessment evaluation is really when it starts getting into very key things that you have to do. So obviously you have to conduct some sort of pre-anesthetic assessment and document such. You have to develop a plan for your anesthesia care. Uh, you must obtain consent for that care, uh, document everything, make sure your equipment is uh, functional prior to the anesthetic, and then actually implement that plan and manage it throughout, including positioning, alarms, kind of basic things, oxygenation, cardiovascular stuff, maintaining temperature stuff, try and prevent infections. Uh, transfer of care is kind of an important thing, not only doing it, but actually documenting how you do it. Participate in the ongoing quality review process, which can be very rudimentary or uh, very advanced depending on the facility you're at. Hopefully you maintain a wellness for yourself, uh, but some of the key things here, especially this transfer of care and then following up on your patient post-operatively uh, tend to get people in trouble. Uh, PACU is one of those areas that we get into trouble and don't even realize we've done it. Uh, so you may see that you know your patient gets to recovery and has difficulty breathing. Uh, nobody's following up on that patient uh, and it varies from one place to another. So this is kind of the standards for post anesthesia care that I'm going to go through now. So anyone that's received general anesthetic or regional anesthetic or some sort of monitored care has to have an appropriate uh, post anesthesia management plan. Um, that does not mean they have to go through the traditional recovery room. And we're going to talk a little bit about the different phases and kind of what they mean and uh, patients that are appropriate for one place versus another. Um, so anyone that's transported to the PACU must be accompanied by a member of the anesthesia care team. So it can be the CRNA, it can be the anesthesiologist, and they need to know about the patient's condition. Um, during that time, they need to be continually evaluated and treated during transport with monitoring and support appropriate to the patient's condition. Uh, now you'll notice this is kind of a vague statement. Uh, obviously, somebody has to be there with the patient but it doesn't specifically say what has to be done as far as monitoring. It just needs to be uh, an appropriate for that patient. So if you've had a patient that's going back to the intensive care unit, generally they're going to maintain that standard of care. They'll go back on all the monitors they started off on. You know, if they're intubated, they'll probably stay intubated, uh, monitoring the ventilator and whatnot. Uh, far more common is patients that are just being accompanied by an anesthesia provider that's using their clinical observations to monitor the patient. So you don't necessarily need a pulse ox on the patient at all times. You can look at the patient, see that they're breathing, see that they're pink. On the other hand, if you have somebody that's maybe poorly oxygenated, you may want to have a portable monitor that you take with you to the recovery room. 
The other thing that comes into play is the physical structure of your facility and the distance from the operating room to the PACU. Um, are you having to go across multiple floors? Do you have to take an elevator? I've worked in hospitals where it literally felt like it was a half mile from the operating room to the recovery room. And then other places is just around the corner. So you have to think about that as well when you start incorporating things into your travel plan. When you get to the PACU, you've got to uh, reevaluate the patient and provide a verbal report to the PACU nurse um, by someone from the anesthesia care team. You may also see that some places are going to a written handoff. Uh, sometimes it's done through the computer. Sometimes you just write down some quick features. Sometimes you'll pass them something. But a verbal report is still the most common means. Uh, and then when they get to the recovery room, their condition needs to be evaluated continually. Um, this is applying to all members of the team, not just the anesthesia department, but also the recovery room nurse. Uh, part of the reason they go to that PACU is for a little bit more intensive monitoring. Um, and then finally, a physician's responsible for the discharge of the patient from the PACU. With that being said, it doesn't say the anesthesiologist is responsible for the discharge of the patient from the PACU. You'll see some places, especially those where you don't have an anesthesiologist, that the uh, surgeon is the one that actually determines the, it's okay to discharge the patient. Um, likewise, even if you do have an anesthesiologist, it's still going to be the surgeon that determines the patient's okay to be discharged. Um, you know, from an anesthesia standpoint, we'll determine that they're no longer under anesthetic care, uh, but the physician, usually the surgeon, is the one that's actually going to discharge the patient from the PACU. All right, so looking back in kind of the history of PACUs, starting in the 20s, we noticed that there was a kind of a high risk and high incidence of post-operative complications in the immediate perioperative period. So what would happen is uh, they started developing specialized units to take care of those patients and called them post-anesthesia care units. So they started in the 20s. After World War II, uh, the number of PACUs increased. The other thing you saw was the surgical volume started to go up. A uh, study in the 40s showed that over an 11-year period, 50% of the deaths in the first 24 hours were preventable. Um, so if you think back to other things we've talked about, we really focus on potentially preventable deaths. Uh, we can't fix everything. But this indicates that 50% of people probably would have uh, lived if they'd had uh, better care or monitoring. So in 1949, uh, the post anesthesia care unit became the standard of care. So who do you find in a PACU? Um, primarily, it's run by uh, specially trained nurses. A lot of times, you know, these are nurses historically that were ICU nurses or ER nurses, and then for a little bit more of a lifestyle, came up to the PACU because um, it's usually more of a Monday through Friday job. They have better hours. There are lots of facilities where the PACU runs 24 hours a day, um, but the more common setting is that they uh, are like a seven to three or seven to five or something like that. There's usually not a whole lot of nights, a whole lot of weekends. So that's kind of appealing to people as they get a little bit further in their career. Um, respiratory therapy is also involved in a lot of different aspects of it whether it's post-operative breathing treatments, uh, running ventilators. As our society has gotten a little bit larger, we're seeing more and more patients that go to recovery and they'll go on to their uh, BiPAP or CPAP. Um, anesthesia is responsible for the overall function of the PACU. So the nurses are there, but they're operating under orders from either the CRNA or the anesthesiologist. And you'll see indeed that when you do a case that you'll actually go into the computer or on paper, and write kind of standard orders for your patients when they get over there. Everything from medications for nausea to oxygen, pain medications, that sort of thing. Um, and then there are some hospitals where it's actually run by an intensivist or a hospitalist. And it's kind of interesting because they tend to be a little bit more hands-off and less specialized. But when they get into these settings where that's what they do, um, they kind of bring a different approach to things. And the nice thing there is that if you do have to transition that patient to staying in the hospital overnight, that they're already intimately familiar with the patient. So like I talked about a couple minutes ago, uh, the location and travel really comes into play. Uh, sometimes it's very close to the operating room, sometimes close is a relative term. And it may also depend on what physical operating room you're in inside the operative suite. Uh, it may be quite a ways from the PACU, like I said. Um, so think about your basic monitoring. A lot of times we'll have portable pulse oxes we can take with us. 
Uh, that's the easiest basic monitor. It gives you an oxygenation level. It also gives you a heart rate. Um, but as I said, you can look at a patient and make sure they're breathing. Uh, you'll be able to start kind of learning by looking at their chest, uh, putting your hand up near their face to see if you can feel adequate uh, air exchange, uh, look at the color. All those things kind of come into play to make sure they're breathing adequately. Uh, and then finally, if you have somebody that's been unstable, uh, you may need to consider doing continuous blood pressure monitoring and cardiac monitoring. Usually if patients are unstable, they're going to go straight to the ICU. They don't go through the PACU. But there are some exceptions to that. I've worked at facilities where uh, the ICU was not able to recover patients from the operating room. So they would have to go to the PACU for 30 minutes to an hour before they could go to the ICU. Um, one of the key kind of differences there is that if the patient's uh, intubated, a lot of times they'll take them directly, but it doesn't really make any sense. But like I said, you'll figure out kind of specific politics from one place to another. All right, so you get to the recovery room. Um, Again, just a basic reassessment. Figure out if your airway is still patent. Uh, sometimes patients will come out to the recovery room with an oral airway in. Sometimes they even come out intubated or with an LMA in, and the practice is to extubate them in the recovery room. Um, you know, those places feel like that that's the most optimum way to minimize their termina over time, so the OR keeps making money. Uh, I think in the day of Sagamidex, it's kind of hard to justify having to leave that in there. And a lot of times, even if I extubate or take out an LMA deep, I still have it, uh, the oral airway out before the patient gets to the recovery room. So airway patency, respiratory rate, saturation percentage, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, their mental status. A lot of times these last three are kind of hard to assess due to their mental status, because even if they're awake, they're usually sleepy and they may not provide the best feedback for you. Um, Another kind of physical feature, a lot of times the responsibility of hooking up the patient becomes kind of like a contentious issue. Uh, I always try to do what I can to help out. So if I'm putting leads on or you know putting the pulse socks on, some nurses are kind of temperamental or territorial and they're gonna you know, wanna do things their way so they don't want you touching anything. Um, I'm sure you guys have experienced that in your time in the ICU that you know the ER brought the patient up and you wanted to do things your way, they wanted to do it their way, um, whatever. So also one of the big issues we run into in recovery, as I mentioned, was hypoxemia. So start thinking about why they're having difficulty. Um, are they on room air? Most facilities require patients coming out, especially if they've been under general anesthesia, remain on oxygen. So they may come out on a mask and get downgraded to a cannula. Uh, you may be able to bring them out on a cannula. It just kind of depends on the patient and what's going on. Uh, patients we tend to have trouble with, those that are obese, um, those that are excessively sedated, and then those that are a little bit older. So you get your patient to recover, you assess the patient, they get connected to the monitors, uh, and then you give a report. Um, I usually try and do all those things before I give a report. Uh, some places they want you to do it at the same time, but it just really depends on the setup and kind of your level of comfort. Uh, I'd rather have the patient minimize their off-monitor time if possible, and then we can talk after that's done. Um, but it, like I said, it varies from one place to another. Another thing you may see is that some facilities, the operating room nurse starts the report. So they'll tell the PACU about the surgical procedure, what was done, you know, like number of sites, drains, uh, any significant intraoperative events. And then you really go into the patient care and anesthetic thing of, uh, side of things. The other thing, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, is there's two different phases of recovery. So you have phase one, which is what we kind of think of as the PACU. And they usually have to be in there for a minimum of 30 minutes. And then they can transition to what we call phase two, which is more of like getting you ready to go home. If you have a patient that not, did not go under general anesthesia, they may be able to bypass phase one and just go to phase two. So if you had somebody that just had a block or a little bit of sedation, they're wide awake, there's not any sort of concerns on your part about oxygenation, they can just go to phase two and get ready to go from there. Uh, the other thing you'll see, uh, and it's kind of unfortunate, is that because of bed availability and PACU, there are times that you will have to start recovering your patient in the room. So same standards apply, uh, 30 minutes from the time you complete your anesthetic until they're cleared to go to phase two. Uh, so you may see that you're keeping the patient in there, you're keeping them on the monitors, uh, you're documenting, unfortunately, is continuation of the anesthetic, um, until you're able to get that patient either out to phase one or on to phase two. 
Um, so it just depends on you, your facility, and kind of how things are set up. So one of the real areas that uh, residents get into trouble when they start getting out to clinicals is how they give report uh, because they tend to be all over. Uh, and the other thing is they tend to talk too much. The PACU nurse does not want to hear everything that's happened in this patient's life. Um, you need to be kind of abbreviated and then, you know, just move through things quickly. I'm going to show you a couple of different formats. As I said, some places have a written format that they give you. Um, but it just kind of depends from one place to the other. So just like you had SBAR when you were in the ICU, um, you can have SBAR going to pack you. So one of the important things is to make sure they're actually listening. So just, and you'll see there's kind of two like hard stops here. Um, are they ready to listen to report? Yes or no. If they're not, then, you know, either get their attention or wait until they're ready. And then on the back end of that, after you've finished everything, I kind of close out with, do you need anything else? Do you have any questions? Um, but this takes you through things step by step. And like I said, it may not all be covered by you. You may see that the operating room nurse covers things. So again, you want to verify the patient's name, go over the procedure, who did the procedure, any pertinent mass, uh, past medical history, so surgeries, specifically allergies. Um, you know, if they're diabetic, they're probably going to want to get a repeat blood sugar on the patient. Uh, any breathing problems, uh, history of smoking really comes into play because they tend to hack and cough when they get over there. From the anesthesia standpoint, what type of anesthetic was done? Um, were there any issues with the airway? What antibiotics did they receive and when? What do they have for IV access? Uh, is there any invasive monitoring in place? And these last two tend to be a little bit less important now since we have EMRs and they can just look at the chart and see where they have access. Uh, one thing for you to keep in mind, especially as we put in intraoperative lines or take out intraoperative lines, make sure you've updated the documentation. So if you put in a couple of new IVs and you took out the little tiny crooked one that came from the floor with, just make sure you've updated that. Move on to your intraoperative course, uh, you know, any sort of anesthetic events, what they got for pain, what they got for nausea, um, if they got a neuromuscular blocker, you know, was it fully reversed, any certain uh, or specific surgical events or concerns. Uh, eyes and nose, a significant blood loss. Did they get any blood products? Did you have to send any labs intraoperatively, especially if they're still pending? And then finally, from a post-operative standpoint, what's their status now? You know, are they on oxygen? They may be able to look at it and see clearly they're on oxygen. If you take them back to the ICU and they remain intubated, or if you go to PACU and they remain intubated, uh, any specific ventilatory settings, you may find that that comes down to you at first until the intensivist comes to see the patient. Other places, respiratory therapy has kind of a standard uh, set of uh, vent orders they go through. Any sort of uh, post-operative analgesics or if you're going to the ICU sedation, again, this will usually be covered under your orders, um, but make sure you've put those orders in, the nurse is able to see them. And then finally, what's the plan for the patient afterwards? Are they going home? Are they gonna be admitted? That sort of thing. So this is kind of an overview for it. There's a lot of extra things in here that uh, people tend to get tripped up on. And the other thing you'll see is, in the, you know, when you guys were in the ICU, you probably made the same mistake. You don't understand how patients are asleep in the operating room. You know, you think about what drips were they on? What did they get for sedation? And when the anesthesia provider explains that, hey, they were just on sevoflurane, it doesn't really make sense to you. So again, don't get wrapped up in too many of the details. Just think about specific medications. Big ones are pain and nausea. This is a little bit more basic one. Um, you know, it takes out a lot of the verbiage in there, but it still covers kind of the same thing. Uh, the big thing is just make sure that they don't have any more questions um, and move on from there. This is another version that goes way in depth. Um, you'll see that depending on where you go, there may be a specific one. Just cover all this information if possible. This is a little bit different. This is uh, one of the ones we use at JPS, and this is for patients that go direct to ICU. And one of the issues you have when you go to ICU is generally they're being transferred to another team. So Dr. X did the surgery, but the patient's being cared for by the critical care team or by you know somebody else. Uh, maybe family practice covers the ICU, whatever you have. But there's usually a transition there, and a lot of information tends to get lost at that point. So what we do is the uh, operating surgeon or a resident will go with anesthesia and the OR staff taking the patient to the ICU. 
when we get up there, they have a variety of people that come. The ICU uh, team leader, like their charge nurse, has to be there. The patient's nurse, obviously. And then whoever's receiving the patient from the uh, ICU staff. So whether it's the intensivist, uh, MICU doc, SICU doc, what have you. They want everybody there, and that's kind of our chance to make sure that all the information gets conveyed from one person to another. Nothing gets lost. Um, over time, this has kind of been backed off of a little bit because it was kind of labor intensive to track all those people down every time somebody came back from the ICU. Uh, but it, it's still probably a good reference for you to make sure everything's covered. And the other thing is I make it a point when I take somebody to the ICU that's going to another service uh, to go talk with the physician in charge of that team to make sure they don't have any questions because they tend to be a little hard to track down. We tend to be a little bit hard to track down. So if I can get that information conveyed early on, we tend not to have problems later on down the line. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about those couple phases. Um, as I said, phase one is the first phase. It's a little bit more intensive. While the patient is in there, they're going to get continuous vital sign monitoring, so heart rate, uh, saturation, respiratory rate, EKG. Um, they're going to document the mental status, the blood pressure, the temperature. It varies from one place to the, another how frequently. A lot of times what will happen is it's kind of like blood product administration. They'll document vital signs every five minutes for their first 15 minutes and then every five or every 10 to 15 minutes thereafter. Um, if the patient is still intubated, and like I said, sometimes they'll go to recovery still intubated, um, they may continue to do neuromuscular monitoring uh, to make sure they've had recovery of that. So like I said, vital signs, generally it's Q5 minutes for the first 15 minutes and then every 15 minutes afterwards. Now, even though I said the patient has to stay in phase one for 30 minutes, they may stay there longer. Uh, if the patient's still asleep, if they have blood pressure issues, if they're still in pain, um, so don't assume that every patient's going to be out of there in 30 minutes. The other thing you may run into is they don't have anywhere to go. So the patient's being admitted to the floor and there's no floor beds available. So some patients kind of linger and pack you for long periods of time. The other thing you'll see is ICU spaces kind of come at a premium is that they get used as overflow ICUs. So you may have like boarding ICU patients. Generally, they're the more stable and healthy ones. Um, in the recovery room, uh, but you may walk in and there's five patients, but only one of them's had surgery. So keep that in mind. It may not just be what's going on in the operating room that's influencing uh, PACU flow. And then finally, you kind of want to maintain the same standard there. Keep the patient's blood pressure within 20% of baseline. Uh, the difference is you're going to be the one responsible for that. So a lot of times what will happen is these people have pre-existing hypertension or something's going on. So you're writing medications to control their blood pressure as far as hypertension. On the other side, post-operative hypotension is generally related to what's happened intraoperatively. Um, you may see that sometimes they're given push medications, but if that happens, usually you're going to have to come out and do it. Far more common is for them to receive uh, fluid boluses or maybe blood products. If you have somebody that stays hypotensive afterwards, be concerned that maybe they've had significant blood loss and you may need to do lab testing. So there's a couple different scores that are used in uh, phase two and in uh, phase one as far as making sure the patient has met the criteria to be discharged. And the nice thing is they're uh, fairly uh, quantitative, so there's not a whole lot of objectivity involved. Um, but the primary ones are going to be the standard of the modified Aldrete score and then the uh, post-anesthesia uh, discharge score. And we're gonna look at those real quick. Um, as I said, you may see some variation from one place to another, but think about this almost like your APGAR or your Glasgow coma scale. The other thing you'll see is that you may have to assess this to discharge the patient from recovery. So you may have to come in and actually document their Aldrete score. Uh, sometimes PACU has done that for you. Um, sometimes you'll have to calculate it on your own. So first thing they look at is activity. Are they able to move all their extremities uh, voluntarily or on command? Um, are they only able to move arms? Maybe they can't move their legs. One of the other things that you have to think about here is if you've had a patient that got a spinal anesthetic, um, are they able to be discharged from PACU prior to moving their legs? Uh, some places they not only have to move their legs, but they also have to be able to avoid. So when you start thinking about the local anesthetic you're using, if it's something that's going to last a long time, uh, they may be in PACU a little bit longer. Uh, on the other hand, it, you know, if it's a one-shot deal, you don't want to use something that wears off too soon. And then finally, are they unable to move any extremities? Uh, 
Uh, from a respiratory standpoint, are they basically doing everything? They can take deep breaths, they can cough, so they would be able to start clearing their own airways. Is there some sort of uh, difficulty breathing or really shallow respiratory concerns? And then finally, zero is they're not breathing at all, so probably not a good idea to send them home at that point. Uh, circulation, is their blood pressure within 20 millimeters of mercury of pre-anesthetic level? Uh, note that this is actual value, not percentage. Circulation within 20 to 50 millimeters. And then finally, is it outside of 50? Mental state, are they fully awake? Uh, do you have to wake them up to talk to them? And then finally, are they unresponsive? And then oxygen saturation, is it greater than 92% on room air? Are they requiring supplemental oxygen to maintain uh, greater than 90%? You know, are they uh, less than 92% even on oxygen? And one of the things this score doesn't account for really well is pre-existing conditions. Um, you know, if you have somebody that's paraplegic, they may not have movement of all their extremities. Or on the other hand, you have somebody that's on chronic oxygen therapy. So you have to take those things into account. Or maybe somebody that uh, always has trouble breathing or, you know, they shallow respirations. So it's a good reference point for you, but it's not fully conclusive. Modified score is essentially identical. Uh, you may see that they're referenced independently um, of each other. There's just a little bit of variation as far as the values here, uh, especially for like oxygen saturation and that sort of thing. And then this is the uh, post anesthesia discard score. It takes some other things into account. It's not just things we worry about from the anesthesia standpoint. So looking at their vital signs, uh, this is back to percentage here. Uh, their activity, you know, are they able to walk? It's kind of bad form if your patient gets home and they can't get out of the car because they weren't able to walk when they left. So can they walk? Are they steady? You certainly don't want them to fall. Um, with that in mind, you know, we generally send people out in a wheelchair for that reason. And then they kind of hop into the car and we hope it turns out okay for them. Probably not the best idea. So, you know, make sure your patient can walk okay before they're discharged. Nausea and vomiting. Uh, there are patients that have to be admitted post procedure just for persistent nausea and vomiting. So, if you have somebody that's been medicated and continues to have nausea and vomiting, you may have to consider admitting them for management of that. From a pain standpoint, it's basically a yes or no question. Is the pain acceptable uh, by the patient? Are we able to get controlled with PO meds? Obviously, they can't take their IV home with them and continue medications if they didn't come in with their IV. And then from a surgical standpoint, looking at the dressing, uh, if there's really no saturation, uh, dressing hasn't been changed, that's great. Uh, if you've had to change it maybe once or twice, you may consider that they uh, probably need to stay a little bit longer. And then if you've got somebody that's had continuous bleeding or drainage, they probably need to stay in the hospital until that's resolved. Uh, it's, again, it's bad form for you to send them home in that way. Uh, hopping over for a couple questions. Is it typical that a CRNA MDA covers the PACU for patients that are held there? So what usually happens is somebody will be responsible for the PACU. It varies from one facility to the next two that responsibility falls upon. Uh, you may see that like the board runner, whether it's a CRNA or an anesthesiologist is responsible for the PACU. And what I mean by that is that they're responsible for things that happen after you've dropped your patient off, or maybe they come help you out. Um, you know, you get there and your patient's having issues. That's usually the first person you'll turn to for help. On the other hand, if you drop a patient off, it's also common that that nurse will call you for follow up questions because you know the patient best. If they're not able to get a hold of you, or depending on how the flow of the facility goes, there may be one doc or one CRNA that's responsible for dealing with issues in PACU, and that may be where they go. The other thing you'll see is over time, um, usually they only call back to that provider for like the first 15 to 30 minutes. Stuff that develops down the line, you're going to be wrapped up in your next case a lot of times. They're going to turn to that person that's covering PACU and let them figure out um, you know, can the patient stay? Do they need to be discharged? Are there other issues that need to be followed up on before the patient can be discharged? Um, that sort of thing kind of helps you uh, figure out, you know, am I responsible for this? Is somebody else responsible for this? The next question is, what is the uh, minimum score you need for di the discharge system to know if it's okay to discharge? Um, as far as the Aldrete score, which is generally the one that we're held to, it's usually going to be an 8 or 10. 
when you look at the uh, like post anesthesia discharge scoring system, because it incorporates things that aren't necessarily on us, like the surgical bleeding and that sort of thing, it's again still usually in that range of eight to 10, uh, but there may be factors that we don't have control of. Like, you know, from an anesthesia standpoint, everything's great. They're hemodynamically stable, they're up walking around, they have no nausea, they have no pain, but that dressing side is just saturated and they've already changed the dressing three or four times. Um, so even though they're still at that range of eight, they may need to stay. Um, so that's kind of the reference point is eight to 10 as far as the uh, score goes before you consider discharging somebody. So after phase one, the patient goes out to phase two. Um, the vital signs slow down. Usually they're taken every 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, primarily the way it works out there is they get a set of vital signs when they get there and then they get a set of vital signs before they leave. Uh, but it depends on you know what's going on and how the patient's doing. They're going to continue the same level of monitoring, um, but it's not as intensive. A lot of times you'll have one nurse that covers phase two for multiple patients as opposed to PACI, where it's primarily a one to one or a one to two ratio, depending on where they fall in that time frame. Uh, phase two generally has you know three or four patients at least for each nurse. But they're still going to look at those same things. You know, is the airway okay? Are they ventilating fine? Um, pain, and any sort of post-operative nausea and vomiting. So when you're designing your anesthetic plan, one of the things you want to think about is not only getting them out to recovery, but what happens long-term. Um, sometimes we'll give patients PO medications in phase one to make sure they're okay, um, especially like if they've got to go home or go to a pharmacy and pick up a prescription. It may be hours before they're able to get those medications. So you want to make sure they're comfortable leaving and they'll be comfortable for a little while there afterward. Uh, fluid integrity, are they able to get up and go to the bathroom? Do they seem like they've had any sort of fluid issues? Are they hypotensive? Um, and then finally, back to, again to wound integrity. So just like I said, this is still going to go back to that discharge scoring system. It's just a little bit uh, less specific or less intensive than in phase one. All right, so now we're going to talk about some complications we encounter during recovery. Um, in, this is just in kind of the hierarchy of common uh, incidents. Uh, biggest one is nausea and vomiting, and I will say that this is a little bit dated. I think with more prophylactic administration of uh, PONB meds that this has probably gone down. Um, patients now, for the most part, are usually receiving at least two uh, antiemetics, and I think that rate is down. On the other hand, I think upper airway support has probably increased, as I said, especially as we've seen an increase in the number of obese patients we're dealing with. So those two have probably changed places. But that's just uh, anecdotal observation. I have nothing to back that up at all. Uh, hypotension is problematic. As I said, it's a little bit different when you get to the recovery room. It's not usually managed with IV pushes. You're thinking more of long-term treatments. Uh, so usually they needed some fluid. They needed some blood. Um, next thing is dysrhythmias. Sometimes it's related to the patient. Sometimes it's related to the anesthetic. Um, they may be experiencing a cardiac event that is a result of the anesthetic or the surgical intervention. Uh, hypertension is common, and we're going to talk a little bit about hypertension and the causes because it's not always a cardiac problem. The high blood pressure may be a symptom of something else like pain, need to urinate. Altered mentation can be problematic. Sometimes they just haven't fully awakened from the anesthetic. Uh, the PACU nurses are pretty good at recognizing that. But what you'll see other times, especially like in elderly patients, is that uh, maybe they have a touch of dementia or some cognitive deficits that really flares after anesthetic. Um, rule out of MI. So one of the reasons that we cancel or stop a lot of cases intraoperatively is EKG changes. So those patients usually go either straight to the ICU or they'll go to PACI where they're fully evaluated. Um, so it happens. It's not the most common thing to happen, but it does occur. And then finally, an actual cardiac arrest. These generally are as a result of uh, unaddressed or unrecognized uh, respiratory events, but you may see a primary cardiac event as well that's the cause of it. Um, so those are things for you to think about when you're getting your patient out to the uh, recovery room. Yeah, Kristen's comment was about putting a boopy in IV bags. That's probably a bad thing. All right, so looking at airway, um, we're all familiar with the basic structures, but the primary complications we run into, uh, airway obstruction is one of the biggest ones. And with that in mind, it's usually as a result of either positioning or the tongue. So you see most patients in recovery room, especially if they're having any sort of airway or breathing problems, we usually sit them up. 
um, let them go from there as far as uh, doing a little bit better job of oxygenating. It also helps get that tongue out of the way. Uh, some of those patients may go to recovery room with oral airways in or nasal airways. A lot of my obese patients, I will wake them up with a nasal airway in place because I know they're going to obstruct. Uh, next thing is laryngospasm. One of the areas we get into trouble with uh, airways is that patients either are not fully awake or they're not fully sedated enough when we extubate them. So if they're going to have a laryngospasm, a lot of times it happens when you first extubate them. On the other hand, especially like in smokers or somebody with a lot of secretions, they may be doing fine and then they get over to recovery and they start coughing and sputtering. Uh, and next thing you know, they have a laryngospasm. So if you're in the operating room, it's really easy to treat, right? Because you've got your machine there. You just give them a little bit of positive pressure. Uh, that's usually enough to break it. If not, maybe some propofol and finally uh, following up with some succinylcholine. In the recovery room, things aren't quite as easy to get to. You know, they have all the same stuff. They've got an Ambu bag there you can use to apply positive pressure. Uh, they have propofol or sedatives, and then they have succinylcholine, but it's a little bit slower to get to everything because it's not set up quite as easily. Another area of uh, trouble is airway edema or hematomas. Um, we're seeing a lot of times now, especially for robotic surgeries, that patients are standing at like extreme angles. I did a uh, hiss the other day, and the surgeon wanted the patient at like something stupid, like 37, 38 degrees. Uh, of course, she was really round, and now she's standing on her head, and he's not the greatest surgeon. So she's on her head for six, eight hours. So one of my biggest concerns in that patient was as a result of, and we minimized fluid, but that she would wind up with some airway edema. Um, so you've got to be very careful with those patients about how much fluid you give. And then if you're ever in doubt or, you know, you, you think they're high risk for some reason, drop that cuff at the end of the case and make sure that they've got a good air leak around the cuff. Um, because the last thing you want to do is take them over to recovery and their airway is so swollen that they're not able to ventilate. You may also see that they develop uh, airway hematomas. Unfortunately, these are usually our fault if it's an internal hematoma, but it could be external as well. Um, one of the more common things is people that have neck surgeries, specifically thyroid surgeries. What they'll do when they take the thyroid out is they go in and they put clips on the vessels going to it. And it happens sometimes where one of those clips will pop off in the recovery room and they'll get what we call an expanding neck hematoma where at that surgical site, because of the blood flow inside the neck, you start getting this hematoma that grows and grows and grows, and eventually it starts to compress the airway. Um, those are generally a little bit later down the line. They're not quite like an airway edema case where as soon as you take the tube out, it's problematic. Uh, vocal cord palsy, again, this goes back usually into neck surgeries. Uh, there's a high risk that they have cut one of the nerves while they're doing that. Sometimes we will use uh, specific neuromonitoring tubes to make sure that the uh, laryngeal nerves remain intact. Uh, the other thing you may see is at the end of the procedure, they may want you to extubate the patient and let them take a look at the vocal cords. Uh, the problem for us is they usually want you to extubate. They want the patient to have enough neuromuscular return that their vocal cords would move, but they also want to be able to stick a laryngoscope in their mouth and see what's going on. Uh, so it can be kind of dicey sometimes. Um, but you'll figure out kind of the wants and needs of the different surgeons you work with. Residual nerve block is uh, kind of decreasing as far as the incidence. Since we started using Sigamidex, I think uh, there's probably far less patients that get to recovery that have uh, residual nerve block. But you'll see when you get out there that, uh, you know, at some point you're going to do this. And it tends to be during the summer. If you guys have talked to anybody, you know, they'll tell you that rocuronium is one of the biggest problem agents. I used to call it like random rocuronium reactions because sometimes you'll give a full intubating dose of rock and nothing happens. Um, other times you'll give like the normal dose of rock and hours later, the patient still hasn't had any sort of return on neuromuscular function. Um, vecuronium is far more predictable as is uh, pancuronium, but you'll see that this happens a lot of times, it seems, with rock and then not a neuromuscular blocker, but uh, the marcane that comes in the spinal trays for uh, obstetrics patients, sometimes you'll have the same thing happen. You get it in there, you get a great swirl, you give your local, and then nothing happens. Um, there's all sorts of theories out there about, you know, like temperature exposure. They left the uh, pharmacy stuff sitting out on the back loading dock in the heat, um, but I don't think that anything has really been proven. But with that being said, uh, it's one of the more frustrating patient experiences uh, 
because they literally can't breathe. Um, but usually they're awake enough that they kind of know what's going on. Sometimes they get hypoxic quickly, so they don't know what's going on. But if you see this, it'll be almost like a fish flopping um, because they're trying to move all their muscles, but they just don't have enough strength to do it. So say, for instance, they go to pick up their arms and they just kind of flop around. Same thing with their legs. A lot of times they'll kind of thrash their head around. Um, if I ever have anybody that's having respiratory difficulty in PACU, even if they've received a full dose of neostigmine and glycopyrrolate, I'll go ahead and give them a dose of Sigamidex to try and resolve this. And about nine times out of 10, it fixes it. Um, it's not necessarily related to the anesthesia provider that performed the case, uh, but you'll see sometimes people will underdose uh, neostigmine and glycopyrrolate for the patient. Um, one of the common reasons that comes across if you get pre-filled neostigmine syringes, usually they come in three milligrams. And if you actually calculate the max dose for those patients, most people should be getting closer to five milligrams. Um, and I will usually err on the side of giving more versus giving less to make sure I avoid this. And then finally, the other thing, as I said, is people are getting more fluffy. Um, and even non-fluffy people, we're seeing more cases of obstructive sleep apnea. So if you've analyzed the patient beforehand using something like the stop bank score, you may know they're high risk for uh, obstructive sleep apnea, but uh, you know they are, and they've got a CPAP or a BiPAP, get it out there to them. If not, uh, you know maybe you figure out when they get to recovery, they just don't wake up and they're not breathing real well, they keep obstructing. Sometimes I will uh, stay there with those patients because I'm anticipating problems. I'll usually go ahead and call respiratory if they're not waking up and seem to be obstructing because the last thing you wanna do is know your patient was having a problem and walk away from them and leave them in recovery. Um, that's just a setup for a lawsuit and a bad patient outcome. Um, the other thing you may see, if you have somebody like this that's high risk for airway complications, especially like, you know, they're fluffy and you're worried about them obstructing, I will not necessarily deprive them of medications, but I'll do things that will make sure that they're more awake when they get to recovery. Um, so maybe not give them something like Presidex that's really going to make them sleepy or Benadryl. Uh, more short-acting agents that are going to wear off quickly, so when they get to recovery, they're awake and comfortable. All right, so some risk factors for airway complications. Oops, I'll hop over and catch a couple questions real quick. Uh, Kristen asked, is pancuronium used much? Uh, it really depends on where you go regionally. I used to use it a lot for longer orthopedic cases and cardiac cases because um, one, it's more stable, it's more predictable, and I didn't have to redose nearly as much as I would with like Rock or VEC. Um, it, some places don't have it at all. Some places you may find that they only have like Rock and Pancuronium. Um, so it, it just varies. Uh, I would, when you guys go out, start getting comfortable with all these agents. So if you have a chance to use something like that, go for it. Um, with drug shortages, you never know when you know, say next week, Rock isn't around anymore, or maybe Rock and Vec both aren't around, and you have to go back to using something like Pancuronium or Atricurium or something like that um, that's a little bit older. All right, so risk factors for airway complications. Uh, Patient-related factors, you know, these are their past medical histories that tend to contribute to it. So obviously, you know, breathing problems tend to lead to airway complications. So COPD, asthma, sleep apnea, obesity, uh, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, existing URIs, uh, tobacco use, and higher ASA scores. Uh, and generally just because higher ASA scores are associated with mo more uh, comorbidities. From a procedure standpoint, uh, chest and abdominal surgeries can be problematic. Uh, ENT procedures, because they're usually messing either in the mouth or in the airway, and as part of that, they tend to have a lot of oozing afterwards. So thinking back to those triggers for patients with laryngospasms, uh, if you imagine somebody that had an airway or near airway procedure, and now they've got a little bit extra blood or a little bit extra drainage in there, um, that's like setting yourself up for laryngospasm. Uh, patients in pain can be problematic for two reasons. One, they tend not to take uh, adequate breaths on their own, so they're kind of getting ready for pneumonia. And the other part of that is because they are in severe pain, a lot of times they're treated pretty aggressively. So they may get to the recovery room and get a whole lot of pain medications, and now they're asleep, now they're obstructing. Uh, patients that get large amounts of IV fluids, as I talked about like with that lady that we did the hiss on, they're high risk for edema, including in the airway, so everything may swell. 
And then longer cases tend to be problematic. Your body's lost its kind of normal function. So things may not drain the way they normally do. Um, you know, you may wind up with widespread edema. Uh, from an anesthesia standpoint, problems we get into, usually it's going to be general anesthetics. Um, we don't have a whole lot of problems with regional cases. And a lot of times, even though it seems like it would be problematic, you don't have issues with uh, MAC or sedation cases because you've kind of figured out what they need throughout. So you generally don't send them to recovery where they're too obtunded. Um, the caution, especially when you guys first dared out, is we tend to overshoot a lot of times with our sedation cases because we're afraid people are going to move. Um, and just like with kind of your intubation roller coaster, where you're good at intubating, you're bad at intubating, you'll see the same thing happen with your MAC cases. Like you give too much, so then the next patient you don't give enough, and then the patient after that you're giving too much. It really takes a while to figure out kind of the comfort level for that. Uh, patients that receive muscle relaxant are a little bit higher risk. We discussed patients that aren't adequately reversed. And then those that receive opioids, especially in large amounts, can be problematic. Um, so think about those factors we have control of and kind of how you can address it. So what physically results in that uh, upper way obstruction and kind of how can we address it? The biggest thing is just loss of muscle tone or extra tissue. So for some reason, they're over sedated. Maybe they've got too much redundant tissue there. They're not able to keep their tongue up out of the way. Um, so from a basic standpoint, we're going to start off by doing something to displace that tongue out of the airway. It may be a jaw thrust, even on a more basic level. It may just be a matter of grabbing that mandible and just lifting up on it. And you'll see a lot of patients that just lifting up on that mandible, it's enough to relieve the obstruction. Uh, and you can tell a lot of times by listening to how they breathe or move air. Uh, you know, if it's loud breathing, it's probably not real good. On the other hand, you lift up on that jaw thrust and it goes from like snoring, snoring, snoring to, you know, perfectly uh, quiet. Obviously, if it goes quiet, make sure they're still breathing. If that doesn't work, think about maybe the need for uh, CPAP or BiPAP. Uh, a lot of times these aren't surprise patients. We knew they were probably going to need this afterwards. And then finally, if the patient continues to obstruct after all those things, think about putting in an oral or a nasal airway. If they've gotten as far as recovery, they're probably not going to be real amenable to an oral airway being placed, but you may find out that you can put a nasal airway in there. Um, one other thing for you to think about in this situation, a lot of times this is not necessarily due to like a true obstruction, but that they just have heavy secretions. So you may need to find that you can just suction them out and uh, relieve that obstruction. Um, as a side note, if you go home and your husband, wife, girlfriend, uh, dog snores a lot, you can go over and practice this kind of jaw thrust or that chin lift on them, and you'll be amazed how well it works. The downside is you're going to get tired and not want to hold it the whole time, uh, but if you need a little practice, go for it. So moving on from airway obstructions to laryngeal spasms. So when a laryngeal spasm happens, what's going on is basically the vocal cords are closing, and as a result of that, they're not letting any air either in or out. Um, Obviously, if you're not breathing, you're going to start to get hypoxemic. But the other issue you run into is that you can develop negative pressure pulmonary edema. So what happens at negative pressure pulmonary edema, if you think about how we breathe, we've got the diaphragm down there that's like a big, strong vacuum, and it's pulling that air in. So if I try to pull air in against a closed glottis, it's going to start pulling more and more pressure on everything else that's involved. So one of the big issues you run into is that you start pulling fluid out of uh, that lung tissue. So not edema in the sense that you've got a cardiac problem and you have stasis, but edema in the sense that you're actually pulling that fluid out because of a vacuum. Um, one of the other situations we get into for uh, negative pressure pulmonary edema is uh, patients that maybe bite down on their endotracheal tube or uh, have some sort of, it could even be an upper airway obstruction, but usually it's going to be from a laryngeal spasm. Uh, primary cause is uh, stimulation of the pharynx or the vocal cords, um, usually by secretions, blood, or foreign material. Um, you know, if you've ever had something kind of go down the wrong pathway and you start coughing, uh, you're having like a little micro laryngeal spasm. Now, with that being said, the glottis is doing what it's supposed to. It's trying to keep all that stuff out. Um, the other thing you'll see is that we do uh, deep extubation sometimes where without waking a patient fully up or up at all, uh, we'll go ahead and take out the breathing tube. The downside of that is that they're not able to protect their airway. Uh, so the upside of that is that usually we can get them out of the operating room faster. 
if it's done appropriately in the right population, it's not an issue. Um, but sometimes the candidates aren't really the best when they're chosen. So we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, negative pressure pulmonary edema and kind of what goes on with laryngospasms. So think about negative pressure pulmonary edema as like a non-cardiac pulmonary edema um, as a result of that high negative pressure to overcome the obstruction. Um, it generally happens about 12% of the time for laryngospasms or as from laryngospasms, and the most common etiology is going to be laryngospasms. Negative pressure pulmonary edema can also come from other things. Like I mentioned, you may see it happens as a result of uh, a patient biting down against a uh, endotracheal tube that's occluded. I've seen more than one patient, uh, fortunately they weren't our patients, but patients that were transferred into us, usually for ECMO, um, that were someplace they got light in the operating room and they bit down on that tube. It may not have been recognized quickly enough or treated quickly enough. And as a result of that, they developed a negative pressure pulmonary edema. Another time you'll see this happen is uh, drownings. Patients will have uh, their mammalian diaper reflex will engage. And as a result of that, they uh, develop essentially the same thing. They're breathing against that closed glottis. So they start to develop this uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, you'll hear people call it like a dry drowning. Um, and then people go back and forth about whether that's the appropriate term for it or not. But anytime you have any sort of negative intrathoracic pressure, there's a risk of negative pressure pulmonary edema. Uh, the good news is usually it resolves in about 12 to 48 hours. Uh, the downside is if it doesn't resolve quickly or it's not recognized quickly, the mortality rate for this is pretty high. Um, so it's definitely something you want to pay attention to in your patients and make sure you treat it. Uh, hopping over to the questions for just a minute. Aaron, did you have that when you had your gallbladder taken out? Pretty scared to talk. Yeah. So it can be scary for the patients, uh, especially if they don't understand what's going on. Uh, we're bouncing back. I, I think we're bouncing back to not having full neuromuscular recovery. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is they're still a little bit sedated, so they don't know what's going on. Um, but it's still scary for them. And especially if the family is there, then it's really scary. All right, so talking a little bit about laryngospasms and how to recognize it. Like I said, it's for some reason the glottic close, uh, glottis is closed, usually due to some sort of stimulation. I would pay attention to what nerves are stimulating it. Um, the big one's going to be the laryngeal nerve. So how do you recognize it? Um, one of the issues we get into is people will look at the patient, and if you have somebody with a laryngospasm and you just look at their chest or abdomen, it's going to be moving because they're trying to breathe. That's where part of that negative pressure comes from is they're trying to breathe against it. So if you just look at the patient, you'll see that chest moving. You need to correlate that with air moving, whether you put your hand over their face or actually put that mask on there to where you're able to get volumes. But you'll see that they're trying really hard to breathe, but there's not any air actually moving. Other places you'll see it, if you look at their uh, ribs, you'll see that you kind of get an increased uh, diaphragmatic movement or uh, almost a, like a flailing. It's a very uneven respiratory effort. And then you may actually see that they have retractions as well. Uh, usually I'll look at the neck and then right around the clavicles, and you may see that as they're trying to breathe in, that they're retracting because of it. Um, not a good sign. Laryngospasms happen. It's just like esophageal intubations. They happen. The important thing is to recognize it and treat it. When I did my uh, peds rotation in school, we had one anesthesiologist, and I'm still to this day not sure if he was just really bad or if this was supposed to be a teaching moment but he was constantly inducing laryngospasms on patients for us to fix. Um, like I said, I'm not sure if it was supposed to be that way or that was just like poor technique, uh, but you got pretty good at recognizing them. So if you're in the operating room, kind of basic thing, put the face mask on the patient with a good seal, um, apply 100% O2, and then uh, close your APL somewhere between 40 or 70. Um, I will usually just close it all the way to 70 because at that time it's hard to get a seal sometimes, especially if your heart rate's up a little bit, you're not quite as coordinated as you thought you were. So I'll close the APL all the way to 70 and you don't have to squeeze the bag. Um, so use both your hands on their face to get a good seal because you've closed the APL. So it's gonna put pressure on it and you're just gonna close it, apply a good face mask and then wait on them to breathe. Usually this positive pressure is gonna be enough to break that laryngospasm. Um, if it's not, first of all, make sure you've got a good seal. 
Um, second of all, um, consider moving on to something very quickly, especially if they start to decompensate. Sometimes it takes us a minute to re uh, recognize learning spasms happened. So you may need to move quickly to giving them some propofol or sucks or something. Uh, next thing is suction the airway out. Figure out kind of what the offending organism was. You know, is there blood in there? Is there fluid in there? Um, sometimes like putting an oral airway in, there will be enough to cause them to uh, Lorenzo spasm, especially if they're not sedated enough, um, which is kind of weird because it's also one of the treatments, especially if the, you know, you're having a hard time getting them uh, ventilated because of the obstruction. So if you do all these things and you're still having a hard time getting air exchange, uh, consider going ahead and putting an oral airway or a nasal airway in. Um, finally, like I said, give them propofol or a succinylcholine. Yeah, we'll talk about the Lorenz spasm notch in a second, but you may actually have to give this patient a full strength dose of sucks or rock or something and actually intubate them, uh, especially if this is somebody you're concerned is aspirated or potentially has negative pressure pulmonary edema. So finally, the last thing you can think about is putting pressure on the uh, Lorenz spasm notch. You may hear this referred to as Larson's point. Um, so if you kind of follow your mandible up to where it meets the uh, base of the skull, you'll see where kind of your temporal bone comes down there and you can feel there's a little tip there. Um, that's known as Larson's point. Um, and you may be able to use that as a means of stimulating the patient to uh, break that laryngeal spasm. And all you're gonna do is apply kind of gentle upward pressure there. And you'll find that it's enough to go ahead and break that spasm. Usually it sits right behind the uh, uh, lobe of the ear. So if you're having a hard time finding it, you can slide your fingers in behind your ear and push up. The nice thing for us, especially if you're applying positive pressure at the same time you're doing this, is you can use your thumbs to apply positive pressure to this and then use the rest of your hand to uh, hold that face mask in place. So it's kind of like the double whammy because you're giving them positive pressure and at the same time you're doing the uh, Larson's maneuver. Uh, you may hear people refer to this as uh, you know, uh, Larson's point, Larson's maneuver, uh, any of those sorts of things, but that's what they're talking about. Some people just, you know, say laryngeal spasm point uh, or laryngeal spasm notch is another one. Um, like I said, usually it works pretty well. The other thing you want to do is to give them a chance to exhale. So sometimes what will happen is you'll apply this, you're giving them positive pressure, and you'll see that in spite of that, they're able to cough. Uh, you may also see that there's like return of condensation in the face mask. So usually it's very clear and as they exhale, you'll see some moisture there. Um, but if not, you want to give them a chance to exhale. So usually what I'll do is apply it for three to five minutes. Um, and then you can either open your APL to let them exhale. Or the other thing I'll do is just roll the mask off one side of their face so they can exhale. Um, that's easier for me because I can keep my hands on the mask and not have to go back and forth fiddling with the APL. But remember, they've got to be able to breathe. All right, so if you're not able to break the laryngeal spasms, uh, the patient's going to demonstrate quick desaturation. As I said, a lot of times that this is going to have happened um, over either unrecognized or it took us a minute to respond to it. So by the time we figure out what's going on, they're usually headed pretty quickly towards desaturation. Uh, un the other unfortunate part of that is sometimes desaturation is the first clue that your patient isn't breathing well. Usually it's because we weren't paying attention to what was going on. Um, we tend to get complacent in things and don't notice there's an issue until the patient desaturates. Uh, with that in mind, like when I take monitors off the patients, I don't really get in a hurry because it's a lot easier to take monitors off than it is to put them back on. Um, so if your patient starts to have an issue, uh, it's kind of difficult to try and get monitors back on the patient while you're also addressing whatever the issue is. So what you'll see is they desaturate quickly, the heart rate goes up. Um, the heart rate may go up quickly and then become bradycardic. Uh, or you may see that the heart rate was increased because they couldn't breathe, and by the time they're desaturating, the heart rate's also dropping. Uh, so actions from your standpoint, you can give atropine to try and increase the heart rate, but really it's going to come back to just getting them oxygenated. Uh, but atropine, propofol for sedation, hoping to break the laryngeal spasm, and finally succinylcholine. And usually when the sucks dose is given, it works pretty quickly. Um, but something for you to think about is you're not giving a full dose of suction of choline. You're not giving that one to two milligrams per kilogram. Usually you're going to give like a one tenth dose. So 10 to 20 milligrams will be enough to break it. If it's not, like I said, you can consider giving a full dose and then you may consider from there kind of going on to reintubation.
Um, Ray asked as far as uh, what direction do you apply the pressure? You're going to apply it up towards the face. Um, so you're going to hook your finger there in Larson's point. And like I said, you're going to have your other fingers on their face, holding onto that face mask, and you're going to kind of squish the two together. So usually I'll have fingers sitting on the maxilla, and then I'll have fingers back behind Larson's point, and I'm going to pull the two of those together. So think about it. Um, I say lifting upwards, um, but it's going to be anteriorly towards the patient's face, if you will. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. A couple other questions coming down. Uh, Richard asked, is biting it down on the tube still negative pressure related? So usually what happens there is that usually they've either gotten light or we didn't take the tube out when we should have. Maybe we wanted them to get light. We're like at the end of the case, um, but they bite down on the tube and it results in negative pressure. The other issue you run into is if they bite down on that tube, you can't get it out of their mouth. So you can't ventilate them because you can't get the tube out of their mouth and you also can't ventilate them because they've bitten down on it. One thing that will help you if you recognize it quickly until you're able to address it is take a syringe and deflate your cuff because then they can at least breathe around that tube. Um, because if you've got a tube inside the cords, they may learn to spasm a little bit, um, but they can't fully occlude their cords. So if you deflate that cuff, they can at least breathe around that endotracheal tube. Um, but it's a matter of having the cognitive reasoning to do it at that point. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through y'all's questions. Yeah, I don't know. Anterior superior is kind of hard to think about for that patient. That's why I said just go towards their face, maybe towards their nose, whatever you guys want to think about as being the easiest way to recognize what to do with that. So talking a little bit about airway edema or hematomas, uh, as I said, usually edema is associated with uh, prolonged intubation or long surgical procedures in either a pr uh, prone or a steep Trendelenburg case. You may also see it in cases with large blood loss because of aggressive fluid resuscitation. So think about that when you're resuscitating patients. Uh, things for you to look at for the patient, look at their face. Usually if their face is puffy, everything else is going to be puffy too. Um, so look at their face, look at the eyes, um, and think that they probably have some airway edema as well. Um, I mentioned fluid restriction for those patients being beneficial. So as far as that leak test goes, what you're going to do is suction out the mouth, and then you're going to drop that cuff down. Uh, and as you do that, you want to listen for air moving around the cuff. If you're not able to hear air moving around the cuff, or you don't get like a low exhale tidal volume alarm from your ventilator, they're not leaking air, which means there's enough tissue edema there that that tube comes out, they're not going to be able to breathe well. Um, you may find, especially in a loud operating room, that you may have to take your stethoscope and move it over by their mouth to hear. Um, but, you know, like I said, if for some reason you're having problems, you think they've got a lot of airway edema, please don't pull that tube out. So airway hematoma, as I said, is usually seen following neck dissections, thyroids, carotid surgeries, that sort of thing. Um, and it's going to be a rapidly expanding hematoma that's causing some sort of edema around the glottis. Um, it's kind of artificial edema because it's not actually inside the trachea, um, but it may be enough that you see like deviated trachea, uh, compression of the trachea below the level of the cricoid cartilage, um, which can be problematic because we usually think about things to the level of where an endotracheal tube is, but you may find that the edema is actually down below that, um, which can be hard. You may have to advance your endotracheal tube almost to the level of the carina to be able to get past it, but ultimately they're going to have to uh, address whatever the underlying issue is. So treatment, the primary treatment is going to be uh, decompression of the airway, um, and it's really decompression of the tissue around it by releasing the clips or sutures uh, on the surgical incision. Uh, they're going to have to remove the uh, clot there before re-intubating the patient. Um, if you have somebody that's still intubated, great. Obviously, don't pull your tube out. But usually what happens is they get over to the recovery room, and they start having trouble, and then we're trying to address it, and then you get them re-intubated. Other things for you to think about for these patients, these airways can be very difficult. Uh, make sure you've got backup airway equipment available. And then finally, especially since it was usually either a general surgeon or an ENT surgeon that caused the problem, make sure they're available as well because you may have to do a tracheostomy. This is one patient that doing a uh, needle or surgical cricon can be very problematic because they've already got a large edematous neck. You know, think about it being full of blood, um, especially if you haven't decompressed the hematoma yet.
Um, so trying to do a surgical airway on that patient may be difficult. Um, now the question comes up, who is it okay to be the one to decompress that clot? I know there are times where the CRNA has been the one to pop the sutures or pop the uh, staples to let that happen, um, but it really varies from one place to another. Before I did it, in most cases, I would probably try to talk to the surgeon and tell them what was going on, uh, and that way you kind of have some shared responsibility. On the other hand, I'd rather not have somebody die because their airway was that edematous. The other side of this problem is whatever is in there, is it bleeding? So that tissue may have been enough to tamponade it so you didn't have widespread hemorrhage. When you open up that neck, that tamponade is gone. So you may have your airway issue was resolved, but now you've got uncontrolled hemorrhage of something potentially large, like, you know, the carotid is one of those things that can be problematic there. So, you know, think about a carotid artery that's bleeding or a branch off of it, that can be a big issue. Vocal cord palsy, um, usually it's associated with ENT surgery, thyroids, parathyroids, uh, rigid bronx, or endotracheal tubes that are overinflated, um, especially if they're not in the right place. Um, it can be unilateral, bilateral, depending on where the nerve injury occurs. If it's unilateral paralysis, a lot of times the patient won't be uh, very symptomatic. They may be a little hoarse when they talk. Uh, they may sound different as far as when they actually go to phonate. Uh, but there may not be any symptoms of it initially. So we're going to talk a little bit about the nerves. Um, usually it's going to be due to the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Um, and what's going to happen is, like I said, they're going to be a little bit weak, a little husky as they talk. Think about, you know, like somebody in the morning that's got allergy problems or is a long-term smoker. You know, they get up in the morning and they got to like cough their lungs up before they can talk clearly. You may notice it's that same sort of thing that they're just kind of coarse as they're talking. Um, so what's happening is the uh, cricothyroid muscle is paralyzed because of the nerve injury. Um, and as a result of that, if you actually look at the vocal cord, because remember I told you guys sometimes we'll go in and look at these uh, beforehand, you'll see that the vocal cord can't tense up. So it's almost like think about a wavy vocal cord or it just doesn't feel very tight. And I've got a couple pictures we're going to look at next. Um, but this just shows you what's going on here. Uh, on the right side, or the picture on the left, you'll see that the cord on the left side, which is the right side, right vocal cord, because the way we're looking at it, is nice and tight, whereas the left one is kind of off-center. Notice it doesn't come up to the midline. Um, it's kind of hard to tell the texture, like as far as it's, you know, taunt or whatever from a still image. Um, and then same thing on the other side, you see that the uh, left vocal cord is not moving whereas the right vocal cord has opened up all the way. See how there's a nice gap up there at the top of the glottic opening that you don't see on the left side. So moving from unilateral to bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, um, this is going to result in inability to talk and paralyzed vocal cords. Um, and what you'll see is that each cord kind of assumes an intermediate, or like a midway position between open and close. Um, the downside is because there's no tension on it, uh, the patient may be able to breathe in and actually obstruct because of that. Um, bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve damage is extremely rare, uh, but it can happen. I've seen a couple patients not where it initially happened, but they would come in for a treatment. Um, sometimes they'll go in and put steroids in. Sometimes they'll go in and inject like botulinum toxin and see if they're able to uh, either stimulate nerve growth, uh, reduce edema, or see if they can treat what actually caused it. And this just shows you what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing for you to look at, when you look at that right vocal cord, notice it's kind of edematous too. Um, so there may be a hematoma in there um, that's causing this. But as you can see, you think about somebody going from like a normal uh, respiratory position to this, it would be kind of hard to breathe when they get to this point. Um, it's scary for the patient because they can't breathe. Uh, and it's almost like having a like 90% laryngospasm. All right, so moving on from there to uh, thyroid surgery. Um, and this is just giving you kind of an overview of the thyroid in case you're not real familiar with the anatomy. Um, and what we do now is uh, a lot of times partial thyroidectomies. So to try and let the patient maintain part of their endocrine function, we'll leave the uh, part of the thyroid in place, especially if we're taking it out for like a potential cancer. Uh, they may only remove one lobe. Uh, the downside of that is that if they only remove one lobe, it's a highly vascular organ, so it tends to bleed a little bit. Um, 
and you may also just do uh, total thyroidectomies. Um, both of those happen, so don't be surprised, you know, one way or the other. So concerns for us, uh, you know, obviously we worry about bleeding, but the other thing you'll see is that uh, post-procedure, generally within the first 24 to 48 hours, these patients will develop hypocalcemia, um, maybe indicated either by a uh, Chostex sign with a facial spasm or Trousseau's with the uh, carpal, spa or carpal spasm. Um, hematoma formation usually is going to be immediate, um, but it could occur within 24 hours. I had a patient I did a thyroid on a year and a half ago or so. Um, extubated her. She did great. I uh, went to the recovery room, went by and checked on her. And then uh, my wife was working in the ER that night and said they had a patient that came in after a thyroid um, coding. She had gone home, uh, developed an expanding neck hematoma, had enough uh, cognizance to call 911. By the time the ambulance got there, uh, neck was extremely swollen. Uh, they tried to intubate her on the way to the hospital. They weren't able to get the tube in. Um, and then she got to the ER. They wind up having to do a surgical airway on her. Um, but by that point, she'd had a pretty significant anoxic injury. Um, so it may not necessarily happen while they're in the hospital. Uh, these could be patients that go home. Um, so make sure you give follow-up information not only to the patient, but also to their family of things to watch for. Um, the other thing you may see is that uh, you may have recurrent laryngeal nerve damage that can uh, contribute to that as well, and we kind of covered that a minute ago. Uh, residual neuromuscular blockade, and I know you guys want to break. We're going to get through the rest of the respiratory topics here, and then uh, we'll uh, take a break. Um, but it's important to make sure you get re complete reversal of the muscle relaxants, um, whether you use neostigmine and glycopyrrolate, so gamma X, I don't care. You just need to make sure that they've had effective reversal. If you're not sure, uh, think about grip strength. Can they move their tongue around? Can they lift their head up? Um, are they able to hold it up? Not do they lift their head up for a second and then they can't hold it and it flops back down. Uh, same thing with the legs. Uh, either Can they lift it up and then can they hold it there for like three to five seconds? Um, and like I said, just because you see these things doesn't mean that the patient's airway reflexes have necessarily returned. So if you're ever in doubt, um, you know, have a high index of suspicion that they may need uh, further reversal. We talked about obstructive sleep apnea. We now consider it a syndrome. Um, and for some reason, usually due to redundant tissue, the patients have partial or complete blockage of the upper airway. Uh, one kind of common pitfall we go into is assuming that our patient's skinny so they don't have obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the vast majority of people I know that have worn CPAPs or BiPAPs were actually skinny. Um, some I would even consider like underweight. So don't assume that just because your patient's not large that they don't have sleep apnea. Um, I really think we should start doing a, a propofol sleep apnea test instead of doing sleep studies because you'll see when you induce patients, as soon as you give them propofol, you'll figure out real quickly if they have any sort of obstruction. Um, and I think that would be quicker and faster than doing sleep studies, but uh, anesthesia is not real good at marketing ourselves. So these patients tend to be pretty sensitive to opioids, so consider regional techniques for uh, post-operative pain. Um, and if they have a CPAP, hopefully they brought it to surgery with them. Like we talked about the other day, if you see these patients in preoperative clinic, ask them to bring their CPAP or BiPAP or whatever they have with them so they're able to use it post-procedure. This is that stop bang questionnaire that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's basically just a quick checklist for you to figure out if your patient is high risk for sleep apnea. Um, so high risk is uh, more than five yeses. Uh, intermediate risk is three to four, and then low risk is zero to two. Um, the downside from my perspective is I think this really kind of overestimates patients with sleep apnea. Um, I mean, if you're a male over 50, you're already intermediate risk. Um, if you've got a little extra weight, you're already there. Um, I think most of us are probably in the tired, fatigued, or sleepy category. So now we've added points there. Um, and likewise, I think if anyone is tired enough that they have the potential to snore. So you can see how quickly this adds up. But these are questions to ask your patient. The other thing for you to think about is not just ask the patient, but also ask their family. Because especially with the questions up there, you know, most people don't know if they snore. They may wake up with like a sore throat or something. They don't know if they stop breathing. Um, 
so you may need to ask like spouse or any of those sorts of things because the patient will say, no, I don't snore. And then you ask their wife and she's like, yeah, he snores like a freight train. I can't sleep in the same room with him. Um, so think about those sorts of things. Um, and then finally, the last couple of things we're going to talk about for respiratory stuff is uh, hypoxemia. Um, and there's a couple of different causes. One of the biggest ones is us uh, over sedating the patient, whether we give them too much pain meds, too many benzos, too many of whatever you come across. Um, so it's pretty fortunate that we're able to treat it easily. Uh, give them some supplemental oxygen. As I said, most places require uh, the patients go out to the recovery room on oxygen. So usually a face mask with sometimes a nasal cannula. Um, if you have oversedated the patient with an opioid or a benzo, consider giving them a reversal agent. The one thing I would encourage you to do is, one, stay with your patient if you do that, and two, give it slowly and titrate it. Um, you know, you gave the patients the pain medication or the, opi or the benzos for a reason. You don't want them anxious, agitated, or in pain because you slammed them with a the reversal agent. And then also think about basic things. You can just kind of continue to stimulate the patient and let them wake up. Uh, one other thing that we see that's kind of unique to anesthesia is what we call diffusion hypoxia. So what happens, we've run a patient on nitrous oxide the whole time. So their bloodstream has become saturated with nitrous oxide. When we turn off the nitrous, you see that there's quickly a rapid diffusion of nitrous uh, into the alveoli. So as a result of that, you see your PaO2 um, actually decreases. Um, and on room air, that decreased PaO2 can result in an arterial hypoxemia. And you may see that the patient starts having increased pulmonary issues because of that. Um, as we don't use nitrous quite as much anymore, you don't see it happen. Um, but big thing, get your patient on oxygen, keep them on oxygen for a couple minutes, because it's usually a pretty quick process. I'm talking about like five to 10 minutes after turning the nitrous off. Um, so if you think about the average time from wake up to being out of the room, most people have gone through this diffusion hypoxia phase. Um, but if not, you may see that during phase one, they tend to have problems. All right, we'll stop right there for a minute. You guys can take a break. It's 1021. We'll come back at 1026.
All right. So we're going to start off talking about some of the cardiac stuff. Uh, Jason asked, what would you do if your patient is still weak, but you gave the max dose of neostigmine and they received a neuromuscular agent that doesn't work with Sigamidex? Uh, my first question would be, which neuromuscular agent doesn't work with Sigamidex? Because I know you guys are told to just use it with Rock and Vec, but if you actually go out there and look, you'll see that it works with uh, pancuronium as well. Um, and the other thing you'll see is when you get to clinicals that if you use uh, like atricurium or cisatricurium, it's basically like putting water on the patient. It doesn't accomplish much. Um, so um, I haven't had a patient that I gave Sigamidex to that it didn't work. Um, so I would say, you know, look at it. Um, now you may have to give a higher dose of Sigamidex and consider monitoring them, um, but Sigamidex works on pretty much everything. All right, so first uh, cardiac complication we run into is uh, systemic hypertension, and this is one of the more common ones we have to deal with. Um, usually it's because they've got hypertension beforehand that uh, just needs to be addressed. So the treatment threshold or what you actually consider hypertension varies from one patient to another. Uh, some places it's a systolic blood pressure of 160. Some places it's a, a diastolic blood pressure of uh, 110, some places it's systolic at 180. Um, the important thing for you to take into account here is what is the patient's actual like baseline blood pressure. Um, if they roll in hypertensive, we probably don't want to be like the white knight and fix all the blood pressure issues for this patient because they're going to stroke out. So see where they stand beforehand before you actually address things. Uh, common causes of hypertension, like I said, it may be totally non-cardiac. Uh, they may be emerging, they're excited, uh, they're moving around. Sometimes it's just an erroneous value. Uh, we've all seen that patient that you were trying to check their blood pressure and they were waving their arm around and you may not get a good value. Uh, they may be shivering, so you don't get accurate measurement there. On the other hand, this could be a symptom of something else. Uh, they may be hypercapnic. So as their CO2 goes up, you see that their uh, blood pressure goes up. Uh, they may be in pain. Maybe it's somebody that's really stoic. And they're saying they're not in pain, but when you look at their blood pressure, it's telling you a different story. Uh, they may be agitated. Uh, bowels may just be distended, or they may just need to pee. Um, the problem you get into, especially if you use like longer lasting medications, is that if any of these other causes or the reason their blood pressure is up and you fix that, now you're dealing with hypotension because of the medication you gave. So say, for instance, your patient really just needed to pee, but the nurse called because the blood pressure was high. Um, they pee, their blood pressure comes down, and now all of a sudden medication X, Y, and Z kick in, and their blood pressure is really low. So one thing I would encourage you guys to do, and I talked about it earlier, if you have trouble in PACU is go look at the patient um, or have somebody go look at them uh, because you really need to get the whole picture. Uh, so generally what's going to happen is between you and the surgeon, you're going to figure out where you want to keep the patient's blood pressure. Uh, it may be tied into the surgical procedure they've had. So if you had somebody that, say, for instance, had that thyroid dissection, they may not want their blood pressure really high because that increases the risk of popping a clot and then winding up with that neck hematoma. Um, so talk about the with the surgeon. Uh, as I said, treat the underlying causes and use rapid acting medications. Um, and I just listed a couple of them here. Labetalol is the most common we use because it's a quick onset and it goes away uh, pretty quickly. So especially if you have somebody with an elevated heart rate and elevated blood pressure, I would consider uh, hydro, uh, labetalol. If you have somebody who is hypertensive, but bradycardic or borderline bradycardic, I would consider hydrolyzine because it doesn't affect your heart rate as much. With that being said, remember that hydrolyzine takes a while to work. So it's not gonna be instant gratification. You're probably gonna have to wait 15 or 20 minutes before you see the results you want. Um, sometimes nurses don't wait long enough and they want to give something else. And now you've got an additive effect of uh, their blood pressure coming down twice as fast because they've gotten two agents. If you have patients that are on daily beta blockers, a lot of times metoprolol works a little bit better. But keep in mind, again, it's a little bit longer lasting medication. All right, so going from hypertension to hypotension, um, we kind of break it up into three different categories. So you've got hypovolemic, where they've got decreased preload. So for some reason, their volume is low. Uh, they're dehydrated. They're under-resuscitated. Um, you know, they bled out too much. 
distributive. So for some reason, they've got decreased afterload. Um, maybe they're septic, maybe they're anaphylactic, uh, any of those things. For some reason, they've uh, vasodilated peripherally. And then finally, cardiogenic. Uh, for some reason, the pump's not working the way it wants or should be doing. And I just break that down because that helps you start thinking about how to treat it. There are lots of specific causes there. Uh, say, for instance, you've got a patient and spinal shock that could lead to distributive shock, um, which is also kind of a relative hypovolemia. Not necessarily because they're truly hypovolemic, but because their tank has gotten bigger than the volume they have to accommodate it. So from the decrease preload, uh, you may see it occur because of third spacing. So if you've got somebody that was maybe dehydrated already and got a purely crystalloid-based resuscitation, you may see that they become edematous, and as a result of that, their intravascular volume becomes depleted. Uh, we may have under-resuscitated the patient. Uh, sometimes that's an intentional. So if you think about that patient that maybe is in a steep Trendelenburg for a whole case, we may not have given them a whole lot of crystalloid and maybe used a vasopressor to keep their blood pressure up. In the end, we're going to have to transition them from that vasopressor to fluid resuscitation. So as they start closing and getting towards taking the patient off their head, you may start coming down on your vasopressors and giving them some fluid. Um, that way, when they get to the recovery room, they don't have the blood pressure issues. Because we're not going to send this patient to recovery on a, a vasopressin drip or a, you know, a phenylephrine drip for their blood pressure. They're going to freak out and need to send the patient to the ICU. Um, the other thing you might see is it could be artificial. They may lose sympathetic tone because of a neuroaxial uh, blockade. So if you give somebody a spinal, you'll see that you get pretty systemic uh, vasodilation quickly. So heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes down. And then finally, this is one that may not necessarily be our fault, but it's something we need to consider. Is there ongoing bleeding with this patient? Uh, maybe we went in or maybe the surgeon caused the bleeding and just didn't recognize it was still going on. So think about how you can kind of assess that. Do they have a drain in place? You know, can you go look at that little hand grenade and it's full of blood and the nurse is like, oh, yeah, I've dumped it, you know, 10 times or go look at their wound vac. Are they on their second canister? Think about things like that as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the patient needs to go back to surgery, but it could mean they're still bleeding and there's an ongoing issue. So from a distributive standpoint, uh, for some reason, there's decreased afterload. Uh, lots of causes. One of the more common ones is uh, sepsis or an allergic reaction. Uh, so you may see for some reason they're just peripherally vasodilated. Um, so it's almost like I said, an artificial hypovolemia. A lot of times this will initially respond to fluids, but these patients usually wind up with one, you have to address the cause, and two, they wind up going on some sort of vasoactive medication and going to the ICU. Um, the other thing you may see is that there's been some sort of uh, atrogenic sympathectomy. So maybe the patient went in for uh, spinal surgery, and while they were in there, uh, bad things happened. There was pressure placed on stuff. Maybe there were unstable vertebrae that shifted around. And now the patient's got some sort of pressure on their spinal column. You may see that as a result of that, they kind of have an artificial um, sympathectomy. So something for you to think about with those critical patients, they're very fragile. Um, small doses of anesthetics could have a really exaggerated effect. Um, and you'll see a lot of times these patients rely on exaggerated sympathetic tone to maintain their heart rate and blood pressure. So if you start treating these patients, be very cautious. You can always give more of stuff, um, but give a little bit and see what happens before you go crazy with stuff. From an allergic reaction standpoint, uh, we have two primary types, anaphylactic and anaphylactoid. Uh, most of the time we use epinephrine as the drug of choice to treat hypotension due to an allergic reaction. Um, does anybody know what the most common drug class to cause anaphylactic reactions is? You've seen it multiple times. Is everybody asleep now? Yeah, muscle relaxants most commonly going to be rocuronium. Um, the downside is if you think about the sequence of when we give medications, usually rock is right in there with like propofol and fentanyl and lidocaine and a whole bunch of other stuff that we give on induction. So the patient becomes hypotensive. We attribute it to the vasodilation from the propofol um, and don't recognize that's what's going on. Um, other things that will cause it for you, uh, natural rubber latex, though we've done our best to kind of exclude that from things, um, but there are still latex products out there. Antibiotics can cause it. 
Um, and then less commonly, like specific hypnotic agents, colloids, um, all those other sorts of things. But if you start thinking about the most common causes, it's going to be muscle relaxants, latex, and antibiotics. Uh, why do muscle relaxants cause the problem? Uh, they're engineered with uh, quaternary ammonium ions. And generally what happens is you have a histamine release, they vasodilate, you get erythrema, you get edema, they become hypotensive. Uh, you may get some gut constriction, tachycardia, uh, they may develop some pruritus, and you start to have uh, a release of the uh, inflammatory leukotrienes and the prostaglandins, which result in bronchial constriction and increased vascular permeability. So the important thing for you to think about with these patients, especially if you just induced anesthesia, is they're not going to be able to say, hey, I'm having trouble breathing. Hey, I'm itchy. So you may have to actually look at the patient. As I said, you know, for us, the most common time for us to have this happen is post-induction. So you just gave a lot of medications. Uh, look for things like your airway pressure going up. So maybe you intubate the patient and your airway pressure is like 18 or 20, and then you turn around five minutes later and it's like 30 or 35. Um, think about that that may be what's going on. But think about other things. Maybe you just gave succinacolin for induction and it's worn off now, so they're breathing back against your ventilator. Uh, you can look for physical symptoms, look at the patient, see if they have any sort of swelling or rash. There's a decent amount of times that patients will uh, not have any issues intraoperatively, not have any issues postoperatively, but you get them over to the recovery room and start assessing the patient or like you take down the drapes at the end of the case and you look at the patient and see that they do have like a red rash or something like that. Unfortunately, it's really hard for us to figure out what they reacted to because they've gotten all those medications for induction. They've gotten antibiotics. They've gotten like local anesthesia. Um, sometimes they've gotten like a prep they may react to. Like so if you've got somebody with an iodine allergy or didn't know they had an iodine allergy and now they've gotten beta 9. Or it could just be as simple as they're not actually having a reaction. It's a dye that's placed in the prep solution. So think about all those things when you start looking at these patients and think about their complications. Uh, latex allergies, primarily in high risk groups, those that have repeated exposures like healthcare uh, providers. If patients have had multiple surgical procedures, um, spinal bifida patients are another real high risk group. Um, usually you see that there's uh, three different types of reactions. The most common is just going to be a contact dermatitis, um, which, you know, usually that's going to be your healthcare providers. They've got a little bit of a swelling, a rash, um, and then you start getting into your different uh, mediated reactions. Uh, your type 4 and your type uh, 1 IgE, which is primarily the mediated hypersensitivity reaction. So moving on from there, uh, talking about antibiotics and allergies, penicillin is the most common allergy or allergen that's involved. Um, the problem we run into with penicillin specifically, it was used as a widespread antibiotic back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So like mom or dad or grandma or grandpa was allergic to penicillin, whether they were really allergic or not. So they tell their kids not to take penicillin because they were allergic. So you see a lot of times people aren't actually allergic to penicillin. They just say they are. So then on our side, we start second guessing things. So what we'll consider is, are they really allergic to penicillin? Um, cefazolin, which is our most commonly used antibiotic, has a small cross reactivity with patients that are penicillin allergic. So what we may do is give a small dose or like a test dose, a one tenth dose of cefazolin to patients that are penicillin allergic uh, to see if they react. So you may try that, uh, or you may just move to an alternative antibiotic. You'll see patients that get vancomycin, especially at accelerated doses, may develop a direct histamine release that kind of mimics uh, an allergic reaction. It's not really an allergic reaction, they're just having a systemic histamine release because the medication was administered too quickly. And there's some basic uh, manifestations for you that we've talked about. Uh, so moving on to sepsis, one of the big ones that we get into trouble with sepsis is uh, urinary procedures. So think about lithotripsy, uh, stent placement, uh, percutaneous uh, nephrolithotripsy, uh, patients that essentially have obstructing stones. And what will happen in these patients, whether it's in the urinary tract or in the kidney themselves, but they'll have frank pus that's sitting behind this obstruction. Um, and so they go in, they start manipulating these stones. And when they do that, this you essentially get systemic pus that's spread out through the blood system. Um, so even though it seems like a very basic case, going in and putting a stent in somebody or doing a, like an Eswall, uh, 
Um, these patients can get very sick very quickly. So primary treatment is going to be fluid resuscitation. You're trying to get that tank full uh, because they will have uh, systemically vasodilated. And then you may have to look at making that tank smaller uh, with some sort of uh, vasopressor support to try and uh, make it smaller and bring their blood pressure up. All right, uh, moving on from there to uh, cardiac stuff. Um, the most common causes we run into as far as like cardiac failure are uh, intraoperative myocardial ischemia and infarctions. And we talked the other day about those and kind of recognizing how they develop. But you may see other things as well. Um, one of the big ones, especially if we have patients that are having thoracic surgery or specific cardiac surgery, is they may develop tamponade. Um, so it's kind of like an artificial pump failure. The heart is doing everything it can, but it can't function properly because you've got that swollen sac that's limiting its uh, extrusion. They may also develop some dysrhythmias. Um, it can be everything as simple as a PAC, which generally doesn't affect things, onto uh, like a ventricular arrhythmias. You'll see that uh, atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias are commonly associated not only with cardiac procedures, but also with uh, carotids and uh, intrathoracic stuff like lung cases. Um, for some reason, the heart doesn't like all those instruments and they're bumping into it. So how do we figure out if these patients are high risk for uh, non-cardiac surgery? This is the basic guideline that everybody uses. Um, and this is not like the be all end all, but it does provide you kind of risk stratification for patients. And it looks at a variety of factors. The biggest one is the type of surgery being done. Um, so high risk patients are uh, basically greater than 5%. So think about major surgeries. Aortic surgeries, uh, major cardiac surgeries, and then peripheral vascular surgeries. And the factor that it really takes into account here is that if they're having to have those procedures, they probably have poor vascular status already. So intermediate risk from there, um, carotid endarterectomies, head and neck surgeries. Again, kind of significant surgeries, but not quite as big as the, the big vascular cases or uh, big cardiac cases. And then finally, low risk stuff, uh, endoscopies, superficial stuff, cataracts, uh, plastics, ambulatory surgeries. Um, so patients that are low risk generally don't have to have any sort of additional testing done. Uh, but this kind of helps you figure out patients that are a little bit more likely to have complications. So how do we recognize myocardial ischemia? Um, first of all, it doesn't necessarily happen in the operating room. Like I said, we can see this happen in PACU. Maybe the stress and strain of surgery was just too much for that patient. Uh, you want to make sure that you're monitoring uh, leads 2 and lead V5 if possible. Uh, some places they only use three lead setups, but I think most recovery rooms have gone to the same five lead setup that you're using in the operating room now. Uh, things that may help you out is using the uh, computerized ST segment analysis. The downside is it comes pre-programmed. Um, so it may not necessarily fit every patient, but certainly if you walk in there and it's like showing ST segment alarms, take a look at that EKG, see what's going on. If you're ever in doubt of, uh, you know, the EKG or trying to figure out what's going on, get a 12 lead. It's not a very big deal to do it. It doesn't cost a whole lot, and it gives you a true picture of what's going on with your patient. Uh, secondary, if uh, you think there might be some myocardial ischemia, consider getting serum troponin levels. And the other part of this is if you get to this point and you're this concerned about the patient, they probably need to be admitted for observation overnight. Uh, so before I get to ordering troponins, I'm going to go ahead and call whoever the hospitalist is and see about bringing the patient in the house overnight and let them go ahead and order the rest of the workup because they're going to be the ones that are chasing down the troponin levels and that sort of thing. So ways we can avoid myocardial ischemia, uh, first of all, doing things that limit our O2 supply. So we know that if our heart rate goes up too high, that we're not getting adequate oxygen supply, um, and we wind up with a demand mismatch. Um, if our oxygen content is overall low, it can be problematic. So getting oxygen in patients is apparently important. Um, if their hemoglobin is low and they're not able to transport it appropriately, it can also lead to ischemia. So we want to make sure that our hemoglobin is adequate. Um, adequate is kind of a relative term depending on the patient. Uh, somebody that's fairly healthy, probably hemoglobin needs to be at least eight. If they're unhealthy, you probably want to think about a hemoglobin of 10. And then finally, you actually get down into the coronary blood flow itself. So think about all the factors that are coming into play there. You know, are their coronary vessels uh, obstructed? Are they constricted already because something is going on? Did we give them a medication that's affecting things? <clears throat> 
so primary causes of cardiac dysrhythmias, the biggest one we see is hypoxemia. The nice thing is it's usually pretty innocuous. Um, so patients are a little hypoxic. You may see some PACs. You may see some PVCs. On the other hand, as they uh, become profoundly uh, hypoxemic and hypoventilate, uh, you may see that they initially become tachycardic and then become bradycardic. Um, if they get to that point of bradycardia, it's a pretty significant uh, injury that's going on. So you probably want to make sure you're addressing it pretty quickly. Uh, you may also see that because of whatever's going on, either through medications we gave them or through their body's response to stuff, that you have uh, catecholamine surges. So you may see that a patient's heart rate goes up because of ketamine. Well, that's okay. I, I expected that to happen. Um, on the other hand, their heart rate may go up because of the pain, and I want to address that. Uh, you may see that specific uh, electrolyte abnormalities cause problems for you. So we try, and especially in higher risk patients, think about people like renal uh, injuries or issues, uh, make sure that their electrolytes are regulated ahead of time. If you have patients that are already anemic, they're a little more prone to uh, all these cardiac dysrhythmias, as I said, just because they don't have that oxygen carrying capacity. And then you may see that patients uh, that are fluid overloaded have cardiac dysrhythmias, not necessarily because fluid overload causes dysrhythmias, but because of whatever led to the fluid overload. Uh, so maybe they've got pump failure that's manifesting as fluid overload. The most common uh, arrhythmia we're gonna see is gonna be a sinus tachycardia. And it's usually just a regular rhythm with a heart rate greater than 100. So think about that patient that's in pain, uh, the patient that's agitated, but it can also be caused by other things. It could be that the patient is continuing to bleed. And our first recognition is that their heart rate is trended up slowly. So when you start having vital sign abnormalities, make sure you go back and look and see how they got there. If you drop them off at one point, see where they've gone between then and whenever you get contacted about this issue. Uh, it may also be development of some sort of cardiogenic or septic shock. So like I said, if you have that patient that had stents placed, uh, maybe they were great in the operating room, but they get over to recovery and their heart rate's up, their blood pressure's down. Uh, you may see it's more specific things like thyroid storm, uh, so think about the patient's underlying endocrine issues. And then finally, it may be like the first recognition of a PE developing. You get over there and their, you know, their blood pressure is okay, but their heart rate's been trending up. Uh, their SpO2 has been kind of borderline the whole time. They're wide awake, but, you know, sats are hanging like 90, 92 percent. Start thinking that there may be something else going on. Uh, most common cause, as I said, is sympathetic stimulation followed by uh, volume deficits, anemia, and then you may see it through like shivering and agitation. Uh, you may see that your patient develops atrial dysrhythmias. Usually these are gonna be due to uh, cardiac and thoracic surgery. Uh, primary uh, risk factors for this, existing cardiac disease or existing cardiac risk factors. You know, if somebody goes in and out of AFib or flutter on a regular basis, it's not really a surprise if we put them under anesthesia and cut on their chest and it happens again. Um, patients that are excessively fluid balanced may have problems. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities may lead to this. A lot of times you'll see that patients that have uh, increased PVCs or uh, runs of ventricular tachycardia tend to be uh, magnesium deficient. So you may give them a gram or two of mag and it corrects the situation. Uh, but like I said, take a look at your electrolytes, especially in your renal patients. Or they may be starting to develop uh, atrial dysrhythmias as a sign of uh, some sort of oxygen uh, imbalance or desaturation. Sometimes you'll see in those patients that have obstructive sleep apnea that they will develop uh, atrial arrhythmias while they're obstructing. Uh, so AFib is one of the not necessarily bigger reasons, but one of the kind of more complicated things we have to deal with in recovery room. Um, sometimes these patients came in with AFib. They've got a longstanding history. Uh, but sometimes this is new onset, maybe because of the surgical procedure, maybe because of something else that's happened. So what you have to decide is this, this something that I just need to get rate control. Uh, so like a pre-existing patient, I just want to bring their AFib down to a normal rhythm. Or is this somebody that you want to try to consider getting them back to the normal rhythm? Um, they were on a sinus rhythm, something's happened, and now they've gone into like a rapid AFib. Um, if you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, in AFib, you want to move to cardioversion quickly, synchronized cardioversion. But most of these patients are going to respond to beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and you'll see sometimes they're just sensitive to being off medications they are supposed to be on. Uh, maybe a dose got held for a couple of days for surgery, uh, and that's why they're responding. Ventricular dysrhythmias, again, think about primarily YQRS complexes greater than uh, 
120 milliseconds. Uh, PVCs are pretty common. They're also pretty uh, benign. Uh, true VTAC is pretty rare, and generally, if you see it, it's either indicative of underlying cardiac pathology or they've got some sort of electrolyte imbalance. So in these patients, think about investigating the H's and T's. Uh, even though we usually think about that for like PEA, you may see that those H's and T's are part of the cause of the ventricular dysrhythmias as well. Uh, Brady dysrhythmias, a heart rate less than 60. There are a ton of causes for this. Um, procedure specific, you may see that they've got bowel distension, elevated ICP, uh, intraocular pressure has gone up for some reason. Uh, they may have had a spinal anesthetic done. Uh, it may be perfectly normal, but it may be something that needs to be addressed. Uh, primary thing you're going to look at is when it becomes uh, hemodynamically significant. So not only is their heart rate down, but their blood pressure is down or they're not mentating as well. Uh, specifically things you'll see uh, with spinals, if you've got spinals that get up to like the T1 to T4 level, you may see that the cardiac accelerator fibers are blocked, resulting in profound bradycardia. This may happen when the spinal is initially placed, or you may see that it's uh, sustained all the way to the recovery room. And unfortunately, the combination of the sympathectomy, the bradycardia, and poor intravascular volume due to that vasodilation can produce cardiac arrest even in young, healthy patients. So be very aggressive if you have patients that develop bradycardia after you've put a spinal in. Um, the nice thing is it's comforting for us because we know we've probably got an adequate level. But be cautious and make sure you're actually assessing to see how high up your spinal has come. Uh, one of the last things we're going to kind of talk about is uh, postoperative cognitive dysfunction. This is really an emerging area. For a long time, we didn't really worry about it, um, and it was just anesthesia getting blamed for things. But we're starting to figure out that there may actually be some stuff, especially in the elderly population, that may be our cause or maybe surgical in nature. So we define delirium as a change in the cognition or a disturbance of the consciousness that really can't be attributed to a pre-existing uh, medical condition, substance intoxication or medication. So if somebody comes in crazy and they're crazy in recovery, that's not a post-operative thing. That's just them. Um, likewise, you may see people who are just difficult to deal with all the time. Uh, you know, one of the common populations we see for behavioral problems is patients with mandible fractures. Usually they got their jaw broken for a reason, and it's not really surprising when they start acting that way. So when we start looking at that postoperative dysfunction, usually it's going to be in the elderly patients. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell who's really suffering from it immediately in the PACU um, because of our anesthesia. So they're usually kind of sleepy to start off with. Um, but patients that are higher risk, so advanced age, think about kind of what I consider old, old, um, so greater than 70. Uh, Preoperative cognitive impairment may contribute to it, um, decreased functional status. So think about people that are like nursing home residents, they're bed bound. History of alcohol abuse, uh, it's not uncommon that they have a pretty significant atrophy and encephalopathy because of that, and that may contribute. Intraoperative factors, if you have pretty significant blood loss in these patients, so think about like a hemocrit less than 30, or you had to give multiple blood transfusions, that seems to contribute to it. Um, if they're hypotensive, that seems to contribute to it. Another caveat to that is think about patients that are hypotensive that they're also higher risk for stroke. So you want to make sure that this delirium is not a stroke because that's obviously uh, more critical than just delirium in general. Nitrous oxide seems to contribute to it. And then we know patients that get general anesthetics versus regionals have a little bit higher risk of it. So how do we manage it? Uh, first thing is think about the patients that are high risk prior to surgery and see if you can recognize them. Um, patients that are severely agitated may require additional assistance in the PACU. We don't want to take off and leave this uh, one poor nurse with somebody acting the fool. If you're able to identify these patients early on, you can try and avoid triggering medications and agents. You know, maybe this is somebody you can do with a spinal for their hip replacement because they're not real cooperative. Um, on the other hand, you may have to do a general and maybe you try and avoid triggering medications. So maybe stay away from opioids or long-acting medications. Uh, Presidex seems to help with uh, post-operative delirium. So that may be beneficial for patients. Um, and if possible, try and get these patients, especially for minor procedures, to an outpatient center. Uh, they to, tend to be a little bit more specialized and streamlined to get people in and out. The problem we run into with elderly patients in the hospital is there's a less requirement and they tend to get admitted pretty easily. 
Um, and we know hospital admission contributes to that delirium as well. So when you start looking at delayed awakening, which may or may not be associated with delirium, uh, take a look at the patient's vital signs. Um, one thing we don't do consistently is have bedside and tidal CO2 in the recovery room, but patients that have CO2s that are too high are obviously going to be sleepy. I think the max value of CO2 is like 70 or something. So it's not real hard for patients to get to the point of being sedated from just being hypercapnic. Get a neurologic exam on these patients. Uh, keep an eye on their oxygenation status. Now, oxygenation and ventilation are not necessarily tied to each other, but they're pretty closely correlated. So if your patient's got 100% sad, it's probably not the fact that they're hypercapnic that's making them sleepy. Um, it could be other things. One of the big things is think about basic stuff. Uh, think about electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, one of the easy ones to check is uh, higher low glucose, uh, especially if you have an outstanding history of uh, diabetes in the patient. The number one cause of delayed awakening in patients is usually going to be residual sedation from the anesthetic. So that probably is the anesthesia's fault, I guess. Um, things we can treat, opioids, think about uh, Narcan and low doses. Like I talked about earlier, um, like 20 to 40 microgram uh, increments. We don't want to get rid of all of their uh, pain medication. Uh, you may consider uh, using flumazenil uh, in low doses for benzos, especially if maybe they got a high dosage. Um, and then for scopalamine, you can also consider using visostigmine. Um, I generally avoid scopalamine for everybody, even my high-risk PLNB patients. Um, but you have to be very cautious, especially in elderly patients or those with uh, psychiatric and mental disorders, in giving them scopalamine. Um, because the scopalamine is bad enough on its own, but the treatment with visostigmine can also be just as bad. Um, you know, for a long time it was known as antelirium but it may cause like bizarre behavior. Um, we had a resident in Treeport about five years ago that was insistent he wanted to try using uh, visostigmine on somebody. Um, I told him no, that was a stupid idea, and I don't say no to most ideas, but the effects just aren't worth it. Well, he eventually found somebody that was willing to let him try it, and I came in that night, and his patient is standing up on the stretcher and pack you yelling at everybody. Mind you, it was like a pretty normal patient to start off with. Um, and, you know, wasn't managed, wound up having to get lots of Ativan to calm him down. Um, so something that could have been pretty simple wound up staying in PACU for quite a while. Um, so there are antidotes out there for all these medications. Just realize that they're not innocuous, that there's lots of complications that may go along with them. Hypothermia can result in delayed awakening. That's part of the reason we try and keep our patients warm. Uh, we talked about the role of hypoglycemia. So if your patient's blood sugar is in the toilet, you probably need to get it up for them to do a little bit better. Um, so that's one of the quick, easy things to check. Uh, increased intracranial pressure. So if this is somebody that is at any possibility of having elevated ICP, they may be slow to wake up because of that. So any sort of intracranial pr uh, procedure, uh, neurosurgical stuff, you know, if you've got anything that affects the venous drainage from the brain, you may consider that they are at elevated ICP. Um, you know, VP shunts, any of those sorts of things, start thinking that there might be elevated ICP. Look for other symptoms, get a neuro exam, uh, check your pupils. And then finally, like I said, uh, residual neuromuscular blockers are just keep popping up and popping up and popping up is a problem with PACU problems. All right, uh, so this is just kind of an overview of the recommendations for PACU discharge. Um, patients should be alert and oriented or back to wherever they started off. If they were bed bound crazy beforehand, they're probably still gonna be bed bound and crazy. Um, for the most part, a minimum stay is not required, but lots of facilities have uh, specific guidelines. Like I said, the 30 minutes in phase one and 30 minutes in phase two is pretty common. Vital signs need to be stable and within acceptable limits. Again, remember what that patient's baseline was. Make sure the patient have met uh, whatever the specific criteria is, whether you're using uh, the discharge score, Aldretti score or whatever. Um, and the documentation really helps out as far as the fitness for that. Um, there's some variability from one place to another as far as patients being able to urinate and eat and drink before they leave. Um, some places say, you know, I don't really care. They can do that when they feel like it. Other places, especially those that have had issues with patients bouncing back because of urinary retention or nausea and vomiting, uh, generally require that patients will eat and drink and pee before they leave. Um, on the other hand, like if you had a patient that had a Foley in, uh, 
they may not feel like peeing because their bladder was already empty, or they may feel like they need to pee and can't. Um, so that's something for you to think about. If people are going home, they need to go home with a responsible adult that's not only going to take them home, but also keep an eye on them afterwards. Uh, one of the debates that keeps coming up, especially like in GI centers, is is it okay to send somebody home in like an Uber or a Lyft or taxi cab? Probably not. Even though most of the medications we give have reached their peak effect uh, while the patient's undergoing the procedure, you probably want somebody there still to keep an eye on them. And make sure that they get written instructions as far as what's due for their diet, their medications, their activities, and who to contact in case of an emergency. Um, because what they view as an emergency may not be a true emergency, so they may not want to call 911, they just want to ask about something. So give them follow-up information so they're able to get in touch with people. Again, uh, there's just your Aldrete score for you to take a look at. And that's all I have. Uh, what questions do you guys have? All right, uh, Ray was asking, can we blunt the histamine release with prophylactic Benadryl? Um, plus added sedation stuff. I will use uh, Benadryl a lot of times for sedation for that specific reason is because I do get a little bit of sedation out of it. Um, usually I'm also giving it because I want the drying effects for ketamine. Um, but if you're having somebody you're concerned about having an allergic reaction, be cautious of giving Benadryl to mask the symptoms um, because Benadryl is going to help kind of mask the histamine release so you may not see the symptoms but they're still going to undergo everything else, uh, the bronchioconstriction and some of that sort of stuff. Um, so you can do it, but a lot of times I want to know that that's what's going on, not try and mask it. It's not necessarily wrong. Um, there's some places where they'll give Benadryl and they'll go ahead and give them like a dose of uh, solumedrol as well if they think they're high risk. Uh, specifically like with contrast allergies, they'll do that a lot of times. All right, what other questions do you guys have?